And so I've got a lot of photographs. I've got videos of verb behavior, um, a lot of audio. So uh, definitely the sound was kind of an important part to get working a little while ago. <laughs> Luckily, we got that working ahead of time. Um, so I'm going to be talking about boreal birds of the Adirondacks tonight. Um, not all of them, because there's a lot of them, but um, some of the more iconic ones. Um, so everybody can see the screen OK? Yes. You're all seeing my screen? OK. <laughs> so you should be seeing the topic slide now? Uh -huh. Yes. Good. So you're seeing the, the slides transition. So I've got three topics. Um, so Linda, what Linda started to talk about, I'm going to talk just a few slides on boreal habitat description, because that's a question, Linda, that I get from pretty much everybody that comes up um, will ask me what exactly is boreal habitat. So we'll, I'll talk about that. So you'll know what that is. And I've got some photographs of it. And then we'll talk about um, boreal species of the Adirondacks. And I've got uh, 16 birds that I'm going to talk about. Some will only be like a, you know, a slide or two, and then some will be more slides than that if I've got more to say about the bird. Um, and then at the end, I'll just show a few slides on boreal habitat locations in the Adirondacks that you could go and visit to see some of these birds. Um, so anyway, that photograph that you're looking at there was taken on Oregon Plains Road of a boreal forest, and you can see the sphagnum bog, um, a spe uh, sorry, sphagnum moss um, covering on the ground in the forest, and it's all conifers there. Very pretty. So as Linda was saying, um, boreal, uh, the word boreal means northern and it comes from Boreas, god of the north wind in Greek mythology. So the word boreal refers to northern, anything that's northern, northern places. When we say boreal habitat, we're talking about the plant life in those places that are to the north. And the plant li life is mainly coniferous, uh, tamarack, spruces. We have three spruces in the Adirondacks, uh, predominantly the black spruce, red spruce, and white spruces. Uh, pines and balsam fir, but also some deciduous trees like aspens and birches, and then sphagnum bogs and fens. Um, the difference between a bog and a fen is bogs are fed only by rainwater. Um, they're a little bit le they're a little bit more acidic than a fen, which fen has other sources of water than rain, um, so they're a little bit less acidic than a bog, a straight bog would be. Okay, so uh, this is um, where we would find boreal habitat in the Adirondacks mountain summits. Uh, usually above 3,000 feet. Uh, we've got boreal habitat in bogs and fens in our lower elevation spruce fir forests at lower elevations, beaver meadows, marshes, swamps, lakes, and rivers. And that trail is um, along the Mountaineer Trail, which is one of my favorite trails in the Adirondacks. It's on Boy Scout property, uh, the Massawipi Boy Scouts, right along the Massawipi Lake in the Antelope. It's a beautiful boreal trail, very beautiful, well-maintained. So here's a, a place where you would find boreal habitat, the top of White Face Mountain. It's our fifth highest peak, over 4,800 feet. Um, and so you can drive up this mountain. It's our only drive up peak uh, into Bicknell's thrush habitat. In New Hampshire, they have Mount Washington. So there's very few mountains that you can drive up into boreal habitat, but this is one of them. So it's a pretty popular peak for people to go and see birds. This is Massawiki Meyer which is our largest bog in New York State. It's in southeastern St. Lawrence County. And this is a partially treed section. It has wide open areas too of just straight bog with no trees. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. So those are tamarack trees. Uh, they're um, trees that their needles turn yellow in the fall and fall off. So it's the only uh, coniferous tree that we have uh, that loses its needles in the wintertime. Very pretty tree. This is an old rail bed that ran through Massawee. Most of our bogs in the Adirondacks had railroads running through them. Fortunately for birders, because now there are roads and paths um, that we can use to get into areas that we normally would not have been able to get into because they're very wet areas. So this gives us an opportunity and there are actually some old railroad ties. You can bike this, but it's, it can be difficult in spots because of the railroad ties. This is Spring Pond Bog, um, which is in Franklin County. It's a nature conservancy property um, outside of Tupper Lake. And you can see the, the sedge, the cotton grass. It's a sedge grass that grows in bogs. It looks like cotton at the top. And if you look out across this wide open expanse of bog that has virtually no trees, you can, it looks like snow. Uh, the cotton grass really is um, real, pretty abundant in the bogs and it's beautiful. So this would be a dangerous place to go walking. Um, uh, I tell people, if you don't see trees, <laughs> then you have a floating bog mat, which you can punch through, um, and it's super dangerous. So you've heard the term bog down, and there's a reason that that term has a meaning. Um, so if you punch through the bog mat, you can actually perish and die if you don't have anything to pull up on, because you're falling into like a mucky, uh, like a quicksand 
thick mud, uh, wet mud <laughs> just underneath that. I had my two golden retrievers fell through a bog mat one time. So I know exactly what's under there and it's dangerous stuff. Um, I had an Audubon group that I was leading to Ferd's Bog one time on the boardwalk. And I was telling them that we were gonna stay on the boardwalk because Ferd's Bog is pretty open. And there was a, a teenage boy with his father out on the platform and he stepped off the platform and went right up to his neck in the bog. And luckily he had a bush that he was able to pull out on. So um, yeah, it can be really dangerous. It's, it's kind of like walking on a, a, a waterbed, if you can imagine what that would be like. You know, you're, you're walking on something that's basically floating. This is a picture plant, which is an insectivorous plant. So bogs are pretty acidic places and it's hard for plants to get nutrients. So a lot of the insectivorous plants in bogs get their um, nutrients from insects. So insects go into the pitcher plant and die in the water, drown, and the, the plant actually eats them. So there's all kinds of like Venus flytrap type, uh, type plants and things like that in bogs. So lots of things that eat insects. And this is the flower of the pitcher plant. So when they're in bloom, it's really beautiful in the bogs. Very, very interesting, unusual flower for the pitcher plant. And this is a trail in the Northville Placid Trail in Long Lake. So because boreal habitat tends to be very wet and mossy, um, you see lots of wooden walkways. Um, when, when trails hit boreal sections, they usually have to put in wooden walkways for people. Again, this is Oregon Plains Road, and you see a very um, thick, mossy ground cover there with the sphagnum moss. I've been in areas that are really, really thick with this, where you know you're sinking in about a foot, and you would really need waterproof boots. Um, I got into trouble a lot in the last atlas doing things like that, but <laughs> really wet feet on camping trips um, from walking in really thick uh, sphagnum moss on grounds. This is the Mountaineer Trail, another section, um, and the Boy Scouts have built incredible walkways on this trail and bridges and really spectacular trail. And in the lower right-hand side, you can see, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but this is a uh, Labrador Key, which is a bog plant. And if you look underneath the leaves, it's very fuzzy. Um, so lots of bog plants along here. This trail, by the way, is only available to the public um, well, it's not available to the public from the middle of June to the end of August, the Boy Scouts exclusively have it, but outside of that, you can go there anytime. And this is a habitat that beavers create, and they create a lot of habitats like this, and it's a really important habitat for olive-sided flycatchers and rusty blackbirds. Um, and we have lots of beavers um, and lots of habitat. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of rusty blackbirds anymore, um, which have precipitously declined and uh, olive-sided flycatchers are also going down in number. Not, not bad yet, but rusty blackbird, is, it's very bad. This is um, the trail to Shallow Lake in the Racket Lake area. And this is Beaver Brook. Um, and this area here ahead of, uh, over this walkway is one of the last places that the American three-toed woodpecker was found nesting, I think by somebody from Cornell. Um, I believe that's the last nesting spot that was found for that bird. This is Mud Pond, and you can see there's beautiful orchids and things in, in, um, in bogs. Um, and I think ahead, I think I, it's kind of small in the picture, but I, I think that that's bog laurel along the edge there. But this is a little pond in Long Lake that you can canoe. It's open to the public now. Um, and you can hear olive-sided flycatchers and yellow-bellied flycatchers and a lot of boreal birds along this pond. And there's rumor that there were still spruce grouse back in this area, but it would take some exploration to see if that's true or not. This is Hamilton County. And this is Rose Begonia, one of the um, orchids that grow in bogs and sphagnum moss ground cover, which is um, pretty much in almost all the boreal habitats, except the areas where you're looking at second growth aspens for Philadelphia vireos, but pretty much all of the other bog habitats or the um, boreal habitats have sphagnum moss. Up on the high mountains, you find this ground cover in the lower elevation forests and in the bogs. And again, the beautiful mountaineer trail. All right, um, I'm, the, is the top of your screen, um, can you see the title? Oh, okay, because I can't. Maybe it's because I'm like the moderator or whatever. <laughs> I have all the controls up there. But anyway, so luckily you guys can see the whole slide on your end. Okay, um, so this is, uh, what it says up there is that we're gonna look at now boreal birds of the Adirondacks and that's a blackback woodpecker male. That I took the photo of right down the road from where I live. So I'm gonna start out, it's kind of taxonomic order. Um, so with the spruce grouse, and if you take a look at the range map, you see that little circle over the Adirondacks? 
that's what you're going to see a lot. We are, um, as, as Russ said, we're very fortunate <laughs> to have these birds in this habitat here. Otherwise, you'd, you'd have to kind of venture to Canada to see a lot of these species. And um, I, I'm going to say a lot of very depressing things tonight because we're going to lose probably most of these species by 2035. That's what's predicted. And we're losing them pretty quickly right now. So I just want you to know, and I'll be talking about that as we get to each of the species. It's a little bit depressing <laughs> to talk about, um, but the habitat and our, you know, our climate is warming really fast up here. Uh, our water doesn't really even freeze now until January. Most of the lakes are still open right now and we've still got loons and we used to lose them in October. So um, major, major changes underway. The farther north you go, the, the warmer it's been getting with climate and we, we're, we've warmed up quite a bit. So I'd like to hear that. So I have the audio for all the species. And they lift their tail up and kind of, they kind of pump their tail up and down. Their sounds a little bit differently from a rough press. You all hear that? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Drumming. We heard it drumming. Okay, so um, that's a male, by the way. That's a Larry Master photo. He's a zoologist. Um, he took that photo. He took this photo of a male, um, and the male and the female look different in the spruce grouse, unlike the rough grouse, where the male and female both look alike. Um, here's a female, and I tend to find this bird. This is how rare it is. I I see one about every three years. <laughs> so that tells you how, how rare it is to see the bird. Um, I was with a group from the um, Buffalo Ornithological Society, 22, 22 23 of us um, were walking on the Madawaska Trail and someone spotted uh, two chicks perched on a branch way in the woods, um, remarkable eyes. Anyway, and I looked down with my binoculars and spotted this female. We watched her for a really long time. They're very tame birds. Um, they don't mind humans, 22, 23 people looking at them <laughs> in the least. Um, but this was a female, she's radio tagged. So they're monitoring this bird. This was in 2017. And then I saw another female in 2020 in the Spring Pond Bog Complex in an area where you're not allowed to go anymore. They've gotten very strict. And now in the Spring Pond Bog Complex, you can only drive to the bog parking lot. You can't go on all the side roads that had the really cool birds like spruce grouse, um, which is a shame. And this is the chick that was with that bird. And cute, an older chick. And this is a male that I found with a Long Island birder in August this year. So that was very exciting. Um, this this um, person on Long Island might be on this presentation. I don't know. <laughs> he comes up about three times a year and we go out. And every time I go out with him, we see something highly unusual. And I said to my husband that morning, I said, I think, I wonder what we're going to see today. <laughs> so <laughs> sure enough, we saw a male spruce grail. So that was very exciting. Uh, right along the Madawaska Trail. And he was not banded or tagged, so nobody knows about this bird. And he was watching us. Um, here's a video, a short video that I took. And you can see he's up in a tamarack tree eating tamarack needles. So this bird is disappearing. And as you saw, we're at the southern edge of the habitat. The bird's doing fine in Canada, but we're losing this bird. And so they keep bringing in birds from Canada and Maine, the DEC trying to bolster the population, but I think that without dealing with the underlying reasons for them disappearing, they're still disappearing. <laughs> they're probably a lot of them getting eaten by goshawks, I think. Um, so I just, I'm not seeing a lot more of them, but um, they're trying, they're trying to get the population back up again. There we go. And then um, so we watched the bird for a really long time eating needles and then it flew directly over our heads. Almost, I thought it was gonna land on us. It flew literally over our heads and then landed a few feet from us on the other side of the trail and then walked into the woods. And we followed it with, you know, keeping a good distance and using our zoom on, on our cameras. So, and we just followed it around for a while. Um, and it just walked around in this beautiful habitat, beautiful patterning on the feathers on the spruce grouse. Just a beautiful, the male, a really beautiful bird to see. And here, I just put this one, it's not a great picture, but I wanted you to see that tail color. It's a rufous tail color, which is one of the, the best field marks to look at really quick. If you're looking at a female spruce grouse, trying to figure out if you're looking at a spruce grouse or rough grouse, the tail is a really good giveaway right away because it's got that rufous color, whereas the rough grouse has the, the dark um, tail band with a white edging at the end. Um, so that's how you can tell. That's how we spotted the bird in 2020 in the Spring Pond Bog Complex because it actually flushed from the edge of the, edge of the road as we were driving. And I caught that tail color um, as it flew. 
And then it took us probably a half an hour, 45 minutes to find the bird um, because they just sit in trees very quietly. They're not singing. They're not saying anything. A really hard bird to find. And this is a picture of where the bird was. I just took some pictures of the habitat um, after we had followed the bird around. It was a beautiful, um, beautiful boreal habitat along the Madawaska Trail. Okay, so a uh, common loon. Take a look again at the range map and you can see once again, we're at the southern edge um, of the, the breeding area for, for loons and they sound beautiful. Um, I had my computer turned all the way up to hope <laughs> People think it's it's um, beautiful and romantic to hear these birds at night. If you ever camped near a near a lake and you and you hear the loons calling, um, but what I've determined from my camping trips is that they're usually reacting to a sound, a human sound. Um, I'll wait till this one goes it's a little loud. So I'll hear a jet going over and then the loons will start calling or um, we have two weeks in, in June in the Adirondacks when the Harley Davidson crowd from Americade, hundreds, probably thousands of Harley Davidsons ride through the Adirondacks for two weeks. So I used to have to like do all my BBS routes like booked around when that was happening <laughs> because you can't have hundreds of Harley Davidsons going by when you're trying to listen for birds. But um, hearing those would make the loons start calling of when I was doing my mountain bird watch surveys, climbing mountains in the middle of the night to start the survey at 430 at the summit, you would hear the loon start going down below and you'd hear a Harley Davidson or a jet going over. So I think, although you know, people think it's so romantic and everything, I think they're actually disturbed by human sound. And I think that's actually why you hear loons <laughs> calling at night. At least I've always seen a correlation to a human sound going at the same time that you hear the loon. Um, this is a Larry Master photo. This is an older loon chick. And according to um, Dr. Nina Schock, the loon, the, she's a veterinarian, she's the loon researcher in the Adirondacks, it's usually the male. So the babies usually ride the back of the male, which is interesting. And this is a younger baby and they're darker. So they're almost black. I mean, it's super dark brown, um, black color. And they're usually under the wing. So when they're very young, they ride um, on the back, but underneath the wing of the loon. And I'm gonna show you a video in a little while that you can see what that looks like. And here's another Larry Master photo. So usually they have one or two babies. The loons are doing very well. They're doing so well that they're now fighting over territory. So loons are not um, committed to each other like a lot of birds, they are, the males are committed to a territory. So if they wanna take over a territory, they'll come into another pair's uh, pond or lake and start fighting and sometimes fight to the death. Um, over territory. So it's pretty violent things that go on. And if that particular pair, if that, that male is successful in taking over the territory and the loon chicks are small enough, sometimes they'll kill the chick too. Um, and, and this, but still, you know, form a partnership with the female, but kill off the young if they're very small. So it's kind of a violent um, situation. Some of you may have seen, I think it was a year or two ago, uh, the photo of the bald eagle that made the rounds on the internet with the big hole in the chest and they determined it was actually a loon bill that uh, stabbed the, the eagle to death So they, because they predate the babies. So there's snapping turtles that grab their legs and mangle them and they have to put them down. Um, and there are um, eagles that come and take them. So lots of things predate loon chicks. The, the loons really hate bald eagles. Um, this, these photos were taken by Murray Head, who's a New York City photographer, um, not a birder, as he told me, but a photographer for children's books. So he wanted um, a loon chick on the back of a loon. And we spent two days in my guide boat on Middle Pond, which was recommended by uh, Nina Schock, the, the researcher, because the loons are very tolerant of people on that particular pond. There's just one pair and they had one baby that year. So we spent two days watching loon behavior. I was in heaven, absolute heaven doing that, <laughs> watching this. Oh, there are the babies on the back. Um, he got a photo of fish, a large fish that it caught. And we're going to see some videos here coming up. And this was a, a behavior that we watched over and over and over again, where they would give a tiny, their tiny little chick a fish that was often too big for the chick, but um, just teaching it. And the chick would drop the fish and they'd pick it up and give it back to it again. And so just this constant, constant training of the chick on what it was supposed to be eating. And here's a fish that it was able to get down. And one of the mornings we had uh, a mist, a, a fog on the pond, and it was, he just got some spectacular photographs. 
another Larry Master photo, another feeding photo. Um, so they don't really uh, create a nest. They just sort of uh, scrape material together or sometimes not, just sometimes spot um, along the edge of water. Uh, they, they have legs in the back of their body. They weigh over 10 pounds. They've got solid bones. They're not meant for walking. And loons try to get their nest right at the edge of the water so they can lean forward. So mostly you'll find the nests at the edges of islands or um, at the edges of inlets or outlets or on sandbars. But if they pick a body of water, like unfortunately our 16 mile, our 14 mile long lake here um, fluctuates. And so the loon nests get flooded or they the loons become too far away from the water and they, the, the adults can't switch positions and the loon nest will fail when that happens. So it's really good for them to pick bodies of water that are fairly stable. Um, here's a nest that what surprised us. I had about 25 people on the Adirondack Birdie Festival trip to Mount Zawibi and we were standing by Deer Pond. We had just come off a trail and uh, we were all talking and I looked down and there's a loon at the edge of the road um, on an old log at the edge of Deer Pond and, and it had two chicks and they made it. I was just worried sick about that nest because it was uh, right at the road. I mean, and just, you know, open to predation at that point. Um, but they're they're pretty good about protecting. The only thing I've seen a loon go off a nest for is when a bald eagle comes flying in um, and it's hungry and the loon abandons the nest immediately. I mean, they come back to it, but the, the loon is very vulnerable outside the water. So here's a loon that we see now. Uh, we, we used to not see the loons in, in their winter plumage, but now we do because um, they're staying they get to stay longer. They don't have to leave for very long anymore, the loons. I mean, they're back the minute the water opens and they stay usually through December now on a lot of the lakes. So um, a change of, from climate. And let's see, I think this is my fish eating video. So in April one year, I drove up to Little Tupper Lake and saw a loon with a gigant gigantic fish over a foot long. And I said, no way are you going to eat this. Um, I'll play this for you. This went on for about 15 minutes and I, I'm showing you the, like the last minute of it. So um, it was wrestling and wrestling and wrestling the fish underwater. Oops, wait a minute, that's not the one. Let me go back one. Uh, there we go. Sorry, it's a pretty windy day. <laughs> but you can see the loom, um, it, it, had, it had to wrestle the fish to get it head first. So on the top of the mouth of the on the top of the, the roof of the mouth and on the tongue, it has something called denticles, which are like the backward facing teeth structures that interlock with the scales. So they get the fish head first, and then you can see him conveying the fish, like he's throwing his head back. The fish is going down, 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 it's being conveyed. So once they undertake this, I don't think they can stop. <laughs> once they start, once the conveyor starts with those denticles interlocking the scales, I don't think the bull would be able to spit the fish back out. Um, so that, that fish has to go down. And it took a really long time, but I didn't, I wondered how the loom was breathing. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, it's still working on it. You can see the neck getting thicker and thicker. That fish was over a foot long. The neck gets really thick. And now the loom's kind of thin. It has to stand up on the water to get the fish down. So there it goes. Get some fish down. <laughs> Anyway, I would have bet a million dollars when I saw that fish and the loon that it was definitely not going to eat that fish. And I was so amazed by that. Um, pretty remarkable. So here, just pay attention to this. This is a loon that sees a fish that it wants to get. It's going to poke its head in the water and see a fish here in just a second. Okay, so it spots a fish. It's going to start following it. and it ditches the baby. Did anybody notice that there was a baby under that wing? <laughs> and it can really be, it's amazing. It can really be hidden. That one didn't even really, the wing didn't even really stick up. It's pretty remarkable. So it can't dive with the baby under the wing. So it ditched the baby and the baby was bobbing around. Yeah. And here is a loon in the middle of a heat wave we had a few years ago. Um, and it, it wasn't, the loon that was doing this, the Canada Jays were flying with their mouth open, which I've never seen before. Um, we were watching a goshawk nest at the time and there were two babies with no shade and I didn't think they'd make it. They did make it, but um, it was a prolonged heat wave and it was really brutal. And this is a bird that spends all of its time in really cold water, like minutes and minutes at a time under the water with a center of gravity that keeps that body low because it's heavy 
Um, it's meant for just, you know, fishing under in very cold water. And here it is, this dark bird sitting out, you know, in this terrible heat wave. And it looked pretty miserable sitting there. Um, but they opened their mouths, birds, when they get really hot. And all the birds uh, were flying around with their mouths open. It was uh, quite a sight that year. All right. So those are, you know, some of these are a little bit, I'm spending a little bit more time on them and some of them will be quicker. Here's the, the black back woodpecker. And I don't know, um, some of the range maps, <laughs> I have to talk to somebody. Um, I pulled these off of uh, the All About Birds just to get updated ranges, but this one, um, it, should, it should show a little circle over the Adirondacks. And there are no black back woodpeckers in the St. Lawrence Valley and Rochester or Buffalo. So um, anyway, the, the map is a little bit off. And there's a few of them like this. Um, I don't know how that happened, but because they were, were correct, the older ones. So here the bird is giving a tech note. This is a male. The only other bird that can make a sound like that is a blue jay. So every now and then a blue jay will fool you because it can make a sound similar to the blackback's keck. That was the rattle call. Give that call when they're upset, when they're, I don't know, for a number of reasons. Um, they do it a lot when they're mating. And that's the drum. It's a pretty um, a definite drum, you know, not as fast as a hairy woodpecker's drum, for instance. It's a little bit slower, a um, little bit like the foraging technique, too. So this is a female. Another image of a male. And you can see the, the hole there. They drill the whole length of that bill, long bill, to get to the wood boring beetle larvae, which is their main main meal in dead trees. And apparently they can hear them. And I'm going to show you a video of that. Um, they can hear where they are. So they know where to drill. Uh, they have incredible hearing. Uh, I've noticed the really, really incredible hearing blackback woodpeckers. Um, the male is the workhorse. He does all the excavation of nests. He does all the nighttime incubation on the eggs. He does most of the daytime incubation on the eggs. He does most of the feedings. They've documented that he does diaper duty, 51% of his visits to nest sites. So he's taking the fecal sacs, the female 3%. So she kind of lays the egg. Um, <laughs> she feeds once in a while, but mostly you see the male doing all the work. And then when you see fledglings, it's almost always with a male. So... They are um, kind of the opposite of ruby-throated hummingbirds. And you're probably all aware that the male ruby-throated hummingbird doesn't do anything except mate with the female. And then she goes off to her own territory and does all the work and raises the young. And he has nothing to do with it. Kind of the opposite. Um, this bird does most of the work of raising young. This is a blackback woodpecker um, male in, in winter time. Beautiful bird, very silky looking. And this is a, a nest and 50% of the nests that I find, they strip the bark around the hole. And some of the, the people that I've guided from the South say that there's birds in the South that do this to keep snakes away from nest holes. I don't know why our birds do it. Um, I have no clue. <laughs> so if anybody has any theories about that, I'd love to hear them. But it's about 50% of the nests look like this. And then some are like this and there's no, no bark stripped at all here around that nest hole. So I'm not sure why some of them do and some of them don't. Oh, so here's a, a, just watch this closely and you'll see the black back woodpecker is drilling. It knows there's a, a, a beetle larva in there that it wants. And you'll see it pull it out. It's a white cookie looking. <laughs> and, that's, and that's what they eat. Yeah. And I took this with, um, I had my scope and an iPhone adapter at the time. So I wasn't, I wasn't very close, but I was able to zoom in and, and get that. And here is a nest that was on um, Bigelow Road. And I watched this nest from the very beginning with the male doing all the excavation. And Larry Masters took this, these videos that I'm showing of this particular nest. And here's the male feeding one of those larvae to the, to the young. So uh, this male is leaning in. When the babies are really little, they go into the hole. Once they're a little bit older, they just lean in. And then eventually you're gonna see a video with babies leaning out when they're older. Anyway, I went back to this nest right around the time the babies would fledge. And I was with some people and we, we walked up and the male was drumming in a tree and the female was flying at a squirrel's face that was in the hole. Oh, we just lost power here. I hope we'll stay up. Everybody still there? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Good. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully we'll keep internet, but we just lost power. We have battery backup and a generator. So I'm not worried about the electricity. I'm worried about the internet. Well, just came back on. It's like it's going to go on and off. But anyway, um, 
So the squirrel gets into the nest and they chew off the heads of the babies right away, apparently. It's really awful. So the, the red squirrel is the biggest predator of birds in the Adirondacks. And they, when they get into a nest hole, it's over within seconds. And all that work, like all those months, and I was just devastated, absolutely devastated watching that. And the, the parents were like just incredibly upset. It was just a horrible sight to see. They were, they were upset, <laughs> very upset about that squirrel. And there was nothing to be done at that point. It's just over with once they get in there. Um, so you'll see the black-backed woodpeckers. I don't have a video of this, but when you're when you're watching a nest, if one of the birds is inside on eggs or with babies, they'll they'll lean out and point their bill straight down at the ground when there's a red squirrel around, and it's a, just a threatening position to be in. And the red squirrels know if they're going to get their face drilled if they come up. And then here's the same nest with a female feeding. I don't know if you've been hearing some of the birds in the background as the winter around there. There's been an older flycatcher and a blue headed vireo. You hear the tech note there. So, anyway, this one had a bad ending. Um, this one had a good ending. This was the lowest nest hole bird I found. This was on River Road, um, sort of. It's probably still within Bloomingdale, but sort of on that road that runs across to Whiteface Mountain from from Bloomingdale. And this hole was three feet above the ground. Um, and normally there, I would say 20 to 40 feet is the span. I've seen them as high as 65 feet. I've seen them in live trees, dead trees. Um, I've heard they nest in telephone poles. I know they've, they've, I've seen them with holes in telephone poles, but I haven't seen an actual nest in a telephone pole. But mostly they're in dead trees, um, all different types of dead trees, different species of dead, you know, red pine, uh, balsam fir, spruces. I've seen them in a number of different varieties of dead trees. Um, and this one was three feet and I really worried about this nest being so low, but she made it this little female and she, this is the tree next to the nest tree. And I got there right after she had fledged and watched her. Um, and she, boy, she called, you can't see it because I was far away and I was using my scope and, and so you can't really hear, but she called and called and called and the male fed her for two hours. I watched and she never moved. She stayed in that spot for two hours and, he, and just yelled and yelled and yelled and the male fed her, never a sign of the female, adult female coming, really cute little bird with no tail. And here's a nest that I found in Long Lake at the fishing brook, uh, it's a canoe put in uh, right in the parking lot. And again, this is one of those nest sites where they stripped the bark away from all around the edge of the, of the nest hole. And here's a video and here you can hear what the baby sounds like, very, very distinctive sound, black dark woodpecker nest. Definitely. Real loud and relentless. Um, so this summer I was with some people and we were driving to see a bird on a road that I hadn't traveled before and I heard that sound and we stopped and we found a late nesting blackback woodpecker. Um, it's really that sound carries a long way, uh, the babies. And this is uh, the same nest. I just took it down to the, here's a female feeding. And I was with some people and they remarked, you'll hear their remark in a minute. Is that mom? <laughs> is that mom? That's a, so that tells he's like, I mean, all we were seeing was the male coming in, and then all of a sudden the female came and kind of shocked everybody. So he doesn't come by very often to feed, but <laughs> mostly the male is the one doing the feeding. But she does come around every now and then. Yeah. Okay. And so now I'm I'm jumping to olive sided flycatcher and uh, aerial insectivore. So they're declining a bit in number. I, they're hanging on okay. I, I'm able to find. Phone. Oh, I thought I heard somebody talking. Uh, so they, they're, they're again, maybe some people gave up. Can you hear it? Everybody, can everybody still hear me? Yeah. Okay. I can hear. Okay. So I'm going to play, I'll play the vocalization so you can hear it. It's a great vocalization. The quick free beers are going to run. And it belts that song. You can hear them a mile away. <laughs> they get up on dead snacks and they belt that song out. I've got a, a, a really cool call note, too. Oh, I've got a cat that wants to join in. <laughs> My son's cat is with us. So anyway, a loud bird that's always out in the open. Um, 
Here's here's another photo of an olive sided flycatcher. They have that dark vest. They're a fairly large flycatcher. Here I took this one um, this summer along the rail bed in Minerva, where they've been nesting every year in red spruce trees. Um, and it's just a wonderful, the rail bed just is a wonderful track because it goes through this, this massive wetland that you would never be able to get into without that rail bed being there. So um, a great way to see them. And again, they're usually in these snags so you can spot them easily and they're looking for their dragonflies and they love dragonflies. And this is a typical habitat for them. Um, usually a beaver created wetland with a lot of dead snags around and, and water um, and lots of insects that they can catch. And now I'm jumping on to the yellow-bellied flycatcher, which is a high elevation bird and a low elevation boreal forest bird. I'll let you hear this bird. It gives um, a chlick. It's a real quick song. A lot of people miss it because it's quick. <laughs> it's, and when those, you have lots of other birds singing, it's really hard for people to sort of hone in on this one. Um, and then some people confuse it with the least flycatcher, which gives the harsh chebec. But this one's slower. That's the turwe call, which is more distinctive than the than the song. A little bit longer too. Turwe call. Your black throated blue warbler in the background there. So this bird um, uh, throws its head back when it gives that really fast call, uh, the chilic call. Show you a photo of that. So it just snaps its head back real quick when it gives that little chilic. And it's one of our uh, birds that we, we survey for Mountain Bird Watch because um, it's a high elevation bird and you can see what's happening here. They're almost apparently disappearing completely from the Catskills at this point. So this is a yearly um, population trend from 2010 to uh, so the last, the last 14 years. Um, they have updated the data already for 2023. And we've got weak evidence of a negative trend going on in the Adirondacks. They're, they're hanging in there. They're still unable to find uh, plenty up on the mountains and, and down low, but I am noticing a, de a decline, but it's not dramatic yet. Um, Philadelphia vireo, uh, and we should have a, a little circle again over the Adirondacks, which we don't on this map, but we should. Um, this is a hard bird for people to distinguish from red-eyed vireo. It's a really hard ear training thing, <laughs> and, it, and it's hard even with ear training, but it's just a little slower, a little um, more tentative. There's just kind of different ways to describe it. A little sweeter, I think, than a red-eyed vireo, not quite as harsh, but still as tough. It can be very tough. Okay, I'm gonna, and this is the bird again that likes second growth aspens. Um, and that's a Larry Master photo with a Philadelphia vireo with a caterpillar. Um, this bird I found, it was funny because I was driving on the road to Spring Pond Bog and I noticed second growth aspens by water and I stopped the car and this was the first bird I found <laughs> outside the car. So sometimes if, you know, just remembering the habitat um, and pretty much whenever I find second growth aspens with birches near water, a white birch and near water, you find Philadelphia vireo. So it's a rare bird, um, but if you can find that habitat, you're, you're likely to see them. And this is an area, unfortunately, that you can't stop at anymore. They want you to drive straight to the bog without stopping because you're driving actually through some private club properties as you go in and they don't want people doing that anymore even if you're just stopping in the road. Um, but this nest was about 60 feet up in an aspen tree and I used my scope straight up with the iPhone adapter at the other end. Um, the nest didn't make it. Uh, here's another image. Uh, this nest didn't, um, it didn't take. And then the following year, they nested in the, the aspen next to the, the the aspen next to this one, and that one also didn't take. This nest I found this year on Route 73 near Chapel Pond. Um, this was 12 feet up in a maple tree, and um, I took a couple of pictures of it. Uh, saw the bird coming back and forth, and then I came back, and the nest was hanging and swinging. So um, it, it, you know they 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 put it between multiple branches, their nest. It's almost like a hangy type nest in between branches and um, it came disattached and it was just swinging. So all of the nest sites that I've seen for Philadelphia Vireo didn't succeed. So I, that could just be coincidence, I guess, but um, it would, would have been nice to watch this one because it was low enough that you would have been able to see the young, which would have been fun. Um, okay, Canada Jay, you, again, you see that little dot over the Adirondacks? 
again, we, you know, our birds are disjunct. They're, they're, you know, separated from the Canadian boreal birds by quite a lot, um, quite a lot of territory there. And this is a bird I could probably talk two hours. <laughs> really neat bird, extremely bright. They make lots of sounds. They imitate blue jays perfectly. They can sound like a woman being killed. That's not on this recording, but they can really scream. So you hear the blue jay in the background and and then the Canada jay starts hearing the blue jay. And they tend to imitate occipiters. So they imitate northern goshawks and sharp shin hawks a lot. Um, and then blue jays do beauty. So blue jay does broadwing hawk up here. And then I also heard do red tailed hawk and red shouldered hawk. But it's interesting that they do, they both imitate different groups of hawks. Um, this is a very, very bright bird. Uh, I am really thrilled because Dr. Susan Wilson from the St. Lawrence University um, has banded seven birds along Savatis Road. And I have a year and a half so far of notes. Um, and I can't even begin to tell you what I've learned <laughs> from that. I just learned so much about this bird from being able to identify, um, you know, who's a female, who's a male, and what's happening in the different social groups, and then how many social groups are coming in. Um, so here's another image of an adult. Here's a baby, and the babies are all gray. So they nest in, they start nesting in late February. Um, and I can tell you from my data, I wrote down the date. Uh, I think it was the last sighting that I had um, at, I feed them in three different places. And at Round Lake on Sabattis Road, I saw the female March 10th was the last time I saw her. And I didn't see her again for 39 days. And she came back out on April 18th. Um, so it was five, five weeks and four days that she disappeared during nesting. So um, I'm learning a lot. And so the babies fledge in late April and you don't usually see them until about the third week of May is when you start to see them when they show them to you. So they're a winter nesting bird, and the theory is, is that they need that summertime to cache food. So they want to get rid of the young soon um, and focus on caching food for the winter time. Another image of a baby. They're beautiful, and they learn very quickly. Here's a transitioning baby, and there's a, a, a modeled-looking transitioning baby <laughs> to adult plumage. The dominant baby kicks the others out by the end of June. It's a horrible thing to witness, and it's extremely violent. And, the, the, and it's the baby, the dominant baby uh, beats up the siblings to the point where they have to leave. And that dominant baby gets to stay with the parents. Um, and it stays with the parents for a long time. So the dominant baby at this point in the year in January, they're still with the parents. So I know that again, because of this study going on and the banding that's that's been done. Um, here's a Canada J nest that John S. Gilton from downstate, if anybody knows John, um, found this back in 2012 on Great Camp Sagamore Road, right at the edge of the road, about eight feet up in a spruce tree. Larry Master took these photos and there were four babies and all of them made it and they got to be full size in that nest. It was a very big nest. Um, here's a video. Larry happened to catch a behavior that's documented, but he thinks he may be the only one that ever got a video of this. So the four babies are pretty young and the female is staying at the nest. And then the male comes in with food and she grabs food from the male's mouth to help feed the babies. So this is described in the account in the Birds of the World account for Canada J. And this is an actual video of that behavior. So she doesn't leave them because they're too young to be left, but she grabs food to help with the feeding. And then when they're done eating, they, they grab the fecal sacs and take them away to keep the nest site clean and um, less obvious to, to predators. All right. And then... This is cute. Um, the birds here, somebody coming with food <laughs> and pop up and you can see all four of them there. Really cute. And this one was uh, comical because uh, the female is brooding the four babies, but they hear, they hear the male coming and kick her off. So they hear him coming before he arrives. Very cute. So this bird is declining. Um, it's declined, I've heard now, 70% decline in Algonquin Park in Ontario. They're attributing it to hoard rot so that those caches of food, because they're constantly caching food, they cache food in thousands of locations to get through the winter. 
that maybe those caches are rotting. What I'm noticing in the Adirondacks, and I think this is the primary um, problem, is, is are the blue jays now stay. So the blue jays are staying through the winter uh, when they used to leave in the winter, so it's gotten warm enough for them to stay. And then two years after they started staying, the, the crows started to stay. So they don't leave now either. So in the winter, historically, we would just have Canada jays and common ravens here in the central Adirondacks, but now we've got all four corvids and the blue jays are grouping up into big groups and they follow every single Canada jay and take these, take their, their stores of food. And I watched one situation where it just drove home what was happening. I saw a Canada jay take some food, took it to a, a spruce tree and, and tried to cache the food and went to leave the tree. And the tree was surrounded by blue jays and the Canada jay flew back to the tree. It's been on for like 20 minutes that the Canada Jay was trying to protect that piece of food. And I'm standing there saying, you know, you're gonna lose that food no matter what you do. And it finally left and the Blue Jays just flew in and took the food. So again, that's a bird that wasted 20 minutes trying to protect a piece of food that it was ultimately going to lose to the Blue Jays. So this is what's going on. And every single Canada Jay that I find is being trailed by Blue Jays. So uh, the Blue Jays are really overpopulating um, huge numbers up here. And, and people are constantly saying, why do I have so many Blue Jays at my feeder? <laughs> And we have a ton at our feeder. Um, they're they're in huge numbers now um, and affecting a lot of other birds um, in the process of overpopulating. So this Canada Jay is at a feeder in Bloomingdale Bog. And if you are lucky enough to live in Bloom in boreal habitat, you can have Canada Jays at your feeder also. They'll come to feeders. They come to hands. They're super friendly birds. They learn very quickly to come to a hand for food. Uh, we were doing a Christmas bird count in Bloomingdale Bog, and this woman was dressed like she was going to church. And it was, <laughs> and she showed up, we gave her some raisins and it just was such a beautiful photo of the, the Canada Jay because they study faces. They learn faces, they look you right in the eye. Um, I swear that we've had, I've had communication with them a couple of times. Um, one time a bird, I was feeding them at the Baddest Bog and a bird screamed really loud and I jumped because it was right next to me when it screamed. And I looked at it, <laughs> what is wrong? And the bird did a blue jay. It did the blue jay imitation. So it was telling me that what's wrong is are the blue jays. And uh, and I said, well, I can't, there's nothing I can do about that. And another time I was with some people and it was the third week of May. And I kept saying to the the, the pair of Canada jays, I said, I know you have young and I really want to see those babies. And I was just sort of joking with the, the birds saying, I want to see them. And, and we walked up the road um, when we were way up the road and we turned around and there they came with the three babies, the brand new babies up the road, knowing I didn't have food up the road. Um, they just, I swear, there's, I swear, I really swear there's communication that goes on between Canada Jays and people. Um, hard to document that, but uh, it certainly seems um, that we're, we're communicating a lot. And this bird was on top of this woman's head. Someone sent me this photo at Bird's Box. She was feeding and it landed on her head. So very friendly birds, very comfortable with people. Um, if there's anything else I wanted to say about Canada Jays, um, I think I told you everything I wanted to say about that. That's a that's a, a group of birds that um, are just fantastic to to live around. Um, here's the boreal chickadee, and sadly, the boreal chickadee is declining very quickly in low elevation boreal habitat in the Adirondacks. It's hanging on in wide sections of boreal, like expansive sections of boreal habitat that are low, but in little patches like the Mattis Bog. Um, Bloomingdale, instead of tallying 17, 19, 20 species on the, on the Christmas bird count, we haven't tallied any in the past four years. There's some there, it's just that we haven't been lucky enough to find the, you know, one of the few, few that are left uh, during the count day. So, um, yeah, they're really, really declining quickly at the low elevation, but they're hanging on at the, at the upper elevation, so it seems so far. Um, cute little bird that sounds like a black hat chickadee with a cold. And they share that black throat, but um, everything else is sort of brown. They have chestnut sides and a brown brown back and brown cap. It's a year-round bird. Um, and this photo I took um, at a feeding area for Canada Jays. The black cap chickadees came in for some seed that I brought, and this particular boiled chickadee came down four times in May that year. It was a really bad food year for them. The wild food was about the worst that year. And it took bread. <laughs> it ate pieces of bread four times and it came right to my feet. Um, very cute bird, but uh, very hungry, I guess. Um, hungry enough to eat something it would normally not eat. And this is a, a boreal chickadee at a deer carcass. Larry Master, when he ran the Saranac Lake Christmas bird count, would put down a deer so that um, we could count the boreal chickadees coming to the carcass. And this was real beef suet that someone put at Bloomingdale Bog one year. 
and, and I attracted a royal chickadee and I got some beautiful photos of this little guy. And here's a boreal chickadee feeding in tamarack cones. This is a baby that we found on the Roosevelt Truck Trail, which is in Minerva, um, just east here of Long Lake, where I live in the central Adirondacks. And this baby was very stationary, like a lot of babies, and it would just sleep. And then every you know 15 or 20 minutes, an adult would show up with some food and stick it in its mouth, and then it would go back to sleep. Um, and we watched that bird for at least an hour, I think, just, just sitting very still. And this is a boreal chickadee up on White Face Mountain at dawn in that beautiful uh, early morning light. Um, it kind of looked almost like a, a red brown. Um, and I took that this year. So anyway, this bird is declining low down. If you really want to see it, um, you know, you, you have a bit, stand a better chance um, up on the mountain still. There we go. Um, switching into big nail thrush. This is our only endemic species in the northeastern United States. So I see people from all over the world that come to see this bird, which is really fun. Um, it's a very sought after bird to see. Um, it's got a very limited breeding range, as you can see in the four states. It used to be five states, but it's not in Mount Greylock in Massachusetts anymore. Um, so New York, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. Um, I believe they're gone from Cape Breton. It shows uh, Cape Breton up on the map here, but I believe they're gone from there now. And they've declined really rapidly in Canada. So most of the population is across the four states now. And a very limited, obviously, winter range, as you can see also, a lot of what, which has been cut down. Um, the habitat for them in winter has been cut. Beautiful voice. Very fluty. It achieved speciehood in uh, 1995 um, from the great cheeked thrush. And then, was, you know, then Mount Birdwatch started in 2000. So at that point, people knew it was already declining. Um, so recent, recently made a species and then immediately determined to be declining. These are the call notes. And then um, eventually they found that it was genetically closer to Viri than it was to Great Cheek Thrush also, by the way. This is the realm of the Vicknell Thrush. That's their, that's their world, those, those tops of those peaks. Um, that's where they live in a very harsh environment, very cold, very severe weather up there. Um, really tough place to live. This is a Jeff Nadler photograph of a Vicknell Thrush. Another one. I took this one in late May. I was up there, um, I don't know what, maybe it was like around May 22nd or so, I think, very, very cold. It was 20 degrees, the wind was whipping, um, and we were heading down and found flocks of big nail thrushes in the grass, along with flocks of Swainson thrushes that were fighting them, and they always win. That's one of the uh, threats to big nail thrushes. Swainson thrushes are now living at the tops of the mountains, and they're more dominant and a little bit bigger, and every time they fight over food, the Swainson thrush wins. Um, here's a, a photo of a Vicknell thrush that was up um, on a balsam fir tree, which is about 99% of the tree growth up on the high mountains is balsam fir with the cones that stick straight up. I took that this photo this year. This one is on a dead snag. 95% of the time when a male is singing, they're on a dead snag. This is a ground bird in very thick balsam fir habitat. I had a man from Singapore. He's a U.S. person, but has been living in Singapore for 30 years, and he said, the habitat on, on White Face Mountain, he said, is as close to the tropics, outside the tropics as I've ever encountered. So it's extremely thick. You can't even see five feet into that habitat. If you're standing in the road on White Face, you can't even see a few feet into it. The, the habitat is so thick. And so the males get up on perches to, to sing, and that's, that's a really great way to see them. Very um, elusive um, uh, kind of bird. You sometimes just see them as a silhouette. Um, they're often in the fog or up in the clouds up there at high elevation. So it can, the first big nail thrush I ever saw was in habitat um, like this on Kempshell Mountain in the fog. And I just, all I saw was the silhouette of the bird. This is a big nail thrush carrying food. Sue Barth from Buffalo took this photo. It's a, and the researcher, uh, Chris Rimmer, was absolutely thrilled because you could see all of the different insects and caterpillars it was carrying for its baby. Um, and they do a lot of the feeding by openings. So most of the nests for big nail thrushes occur along the road up white face, along trails, along rock slides, um, blow down areas, uh, fur waves, anywhere where there's an opening where berry bushes can grow like mountain ash, um, elderberry, uh, they find most of their food at these openings. And so they've already documented that all of the nests are along openings. And then as you go back into the woods, they fall off. 
I mean, not a clear cut, but like they, you know, you wouldn't want, they, they have to have the forest, but they do like the edges of the forest for nesting. And that's where they, so in July, you can really see them much better in July than June because in July they're feeding young and they're right out in the open when they're doing that. Here's a baby that we found on July 16th, right out of a nest. It was in the parking lot at White Face. <laughs> um, and it kept sleeping, it kept falling asleep right in the parking lot, it had no tail. Um, and then eventually uh, it went over to the gravel at the side of the road and kind of nestled down like it was a nest. It, you know, it was definitely a baby right out of the nest. And every 20 minutes or so, the parent would come and stick food in its mouth. And here's an adult uh, big nest thrush. I just wanted to point out that they have a very short femur and, um, and, and very long um, tarsometatarsus bones. And that is an adaptation for terrestrial um, movement, they bounce. They basically look like a bouncing toy. So if you see them out in the open, and I've seen them in the parking lot bouncing off the wall, they look like a child's bouncing toy. They bounce. And this is an adaptation for foraging in very, very thick habitat for a ground bird. So they're just able to bounce all over the place with this extra long uh, bone that you can see there in that photo. And here's one that was bouncing that I caught the tail end of. So when a bird is singing, the big bells, you look immediately for the snag. And we heard this down the mountain, and I scanned the snags and found it right away. And so you can kind of see it there in the middle. And I'm zooming, zooming, zooming. <laughs> the way down there. So this is a big nose thrush. Typically, 95% of the time, they're in a dead snag singing, and you'll hear it. It's always windy up there. So it can be tough for people to hear <laughs> where that went, especially black hole warblers. I don't know if you can all hear the Vic Nels thrush singing, but that was Memorial Day weekend. And this was a bird that um, a really wonderful birder from New York City spotted in the dark. And this is from the days, the old days, I call it, when the birds used to get on a perch and sing for an hour, which they don't do anymore. Oops. I have to shove something. Can everybody still hear okay? Very good. Okay. So this bird, you, can you see this bird? This bird is not in a dead snag. It's perched on top of balsam fir cones that are sticking straight up. And it was on those for an over an hour. And she spotted it in the dark and we waited till light to, um, to get video of, of that bird. So it was really interesting. Um, I think the whole thing played there. It's telling me that I have to shut some things down on my computer. I'm not sure why, but I think we've got power going, I think. Anyway, um, this is Bicknell's Thrush Habitat by State. And you can see New York has about 25% of the U.S. habitat for Bicknell's Thrush. And Maine also about a quarter, and New Hampshire has quite a lot, almost half. And you can see what's conserved. And we're really well conserved in three states, including New York. And except for Maine. So, you know, we're, we, our habitat at this end is conserved, but we've got a lot of species moving upslope, <laughs> a lot of species. Um, there are twice as many species on the summit of Whiteface as there were 40 years ago. So Jeremy Kirkman, the, the ornithologist at the New York State Museum, has been uh, replicating Ken Abel's surveys of the mountains, and he's found that there are twice as many species on the summit as there were when Ken Abel did the surveys. So that's how many bird species have moved up. Robins have moved up 1,500 feet, and they're at the summit now. So there's robins up there, there's Swainson's thrushes, the hermit thrushes are moving their way up. Um, lots and lots of birds have moved up slope. And I'm, I'm amazed every year when I do the mountain bird watch survey, what I find. Because <laughs> every year there's something new up there that surprises me. Um, I'm not going to go over this whole slide, um, but you can just take a look at it. So Eugene Bicknell was mostly a botanist. And he found a Bicknell's thrush in the Catskills in 1881 and sent um, sent a, a, a specimen to Robert Ridgway at the Smithsonian who thought it looked like great cheek thrush and, and classified it as a subspecies. It didn't get speciehood until 1995. In 2010, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife was petitioned by the Center for Biological Diversity to list Bicknell's thrush under the Endangered Species Act. And in 2017, they turned it down which they're doing, what I understand is they're doing that for any, any animal that's primary threat is climate change. Because once you list something, you have to prove that you're doing something about the threat. So they're turning down animals whose main threat is climate change. 
And here are the numbers. So again, I can show you the numbers for any birds that we're surveying in Mount Birdwatch. And in the Catskills, you've got a 9.03% decline um, per year and in the Adirondacks three. So again, you can see the, the Catskills are getting hit hardest because it's much farther south than the Adirondacks. So you would kind of expect some of these things. And the um, big nail thrushes are disappearing from the lower peaks. So you definitely want to stick with high peaks when you're looking for this bird. There are still some on Blue Mountain. People still find them up there, but certainly not in the numbers they used to be. Um, anyway, lots more to say about big nail thrush. Um, it's a really um, important bird to me. It's a bird that I sort of live with um, a lot. The researcher has uh, told me that I've spent countless more hours with that bird than he has because he sees it once a week and I, I live multiple times a week with it during the breeding season so and I spend hours watching its behavior and it's um, a bird that's certainly in trouble. It doesn't sing as often anymore. I just wanted to mention that about Bicknell's thrush. Um, they're attributing that to the Swainson's thrushes um, suppressing them from singing but I think it also has to do with numbers because I'm seeing this happening with other species that are declining that there's less singing going on among the birds that are there. So when there's less birds of the species there, the males just seem to be singing less. Um, and so that's something that I'm seeing a lot of. So this is a this is a positive right here. And there should be a little circle over the Adirondacks for palm warbler, and that's missing on this range map, but they nest in the Adirondacks. This is a bog bird, so you usually go to bogs to see palm warblers, and they are increasing. So this is not a bird that's declining. <laughs> One of the few tonight that I'm speaking about. Um, very pretty bird with its trill. And they are the first warbler to come back, usually by April 12th is the date that they're back, um, and pine warbler right behind them. So they're, those are the two really early warblers to come back. In the old days, you'd see palm warblers um, with a huge snow cover on April 12th. We don't have that anymore. <laughs> we don't have, usually by then we don't have snow anymore, but it used to be that they would come back with snow cover and you wondered what they were eating. This is kind of a washed out one um, in the early fall. Uh, here's one in the breeding season, so you can see that lovely rusty cap. And we've got the yellow palm in the western side of their range in Canada. They're they're brown, and we see those birds in, in the fall when they shift east and come down through our area, and our yellow palms shift over the coast, and that's what you guys see when you see migration for palms. Um, both both sets of, of birds move east first before they migrate. The black pole warbler, um, and this is this is good because you've got the circle over the Adirondacks is a high elevation warbler that you look for over 2,600 feet in our area. So pretty much in the Adirondacks, you're looking at going up a mountain to see black pole warblers. They sound like an insect, the champion migrant. So even the ones in Alaska and Western Canada kind of shift east and double their weight before they migrate. And they, they launch off of Northeastern North America and fly for four days straight to South America. Um, really, really remarkable bird. The people have a hard time hearing. It is a tough bird to hear. They sound like a, a, a an insect. Here's a bird up on white face, another one. And here's a video. What do you hear there in the background? That's a robin up on white face. <laughs> the first time we heard one, everyone thought, what's wrong with that bird? And then the next year there were more of them. And so anyway, yeah, there are robins on white face now up at the top. 1,500 foot ascent um, in in their breeding range now on white face. So lots of things are moving up slope. And um, anyway, so that was a, a black pole warbler up on white face with a robin singing in the background. Again, you see a big decline, a bigger decline in the Catskills and the Adirondacks, but there's a decline. There's not just a decline in Mountain Birdwatch data, but there's a decline across the whole range for black pole warbler. I think I wrote it down. Uh, let's see, did I? I did. It's been a 45% decline in population in this bird. It's been documented. So the, the bird is, you know, it's a it's an abundant bird, but it's um it's it's declining very rapidly. Lincoln sparrow, something terrible is going on with this bird. Um this year. <laughs> I noticed, like, I would say maybe right around when the Atlas started, I noticed that the bird was starting to decline. And each year it was declining. And this year it, it just plummeted. It absolutely plummeted, and I have no idea what's happening. Um, it's my favorite favorite song. Um, there was only one. It's about a bog, and there's usually several. And I, the one bird that was there, hardly sang at all. Um, I took a big group of about 25 people to Massapequa for the birding festival, 
And we went out on a boardwalk where we normally set up scopes and we look at all, it's a wide open section of the bog and, and there's Lincoln sparrows all around you singing and you can get scope views and binocular views. And we went there this year and there was one, a football field away that I could hear that nobody else could hear. It was, it was really far away. You had to really listen. And there was just one and there was no way to see it because it was too far away. And I was absolutely shocked. And Larry Masters spoke with me and he had taken some friends to the same, to the same boardwalk. And around the same time and said he had the exact same experience and he was also shocked. I mean, it's where you go to see them. It's just a wonderful spot to get good views of this bird. Um, and there weren't any. Um, yeah. Anyway, so I don't I don't know. I know that Julie Hart has made it a priority in the atlas. Um, she noticed right away that there were very few confirmations coming in for this bird. So something's happening to this bird, and I don't know what it is. There's some more photos from Bloomingdale Bog, bird with some food. Um, this is the mascot of the North, Old Sam Peabody, 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 or Oh Sweet Canada, 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 if you're Canadian. And these birds are high elevation birds and low elevation birds in the Adirondacks. And that's a white striped bird, and they mate with tan striped birds. And it doesn't mean male or female. So the male could be the tan striped, less flashy bird. And they don't really understand the genetics of the white throated sparrow yet. Um, not really sure how it works, but it's always a white striped bird with a tan striped bird. That's how they mate. Very loud call note. There's again, a white striped bird up on white face. And here's one singing up on white face. And in the background, black hole warbler right below it. So here is the data. It's pretty shocking for the Catskills. <laughs> it's a, this is a yearly, I mean, annual population trend. This is minus 1723 for the Catskills. It's, it's pretty bad. And in the Adirondacks, 6.6. Um, .6, so a huge decline is going on in my mountain bird watch data for white thread sparrow. Rusty Blackbird is, um, you, you can see the circle. Luckily, this is a, a good range map. Um, it always has those check, check notes before it sings. It's really tough to even find this bird in the Adirondacks anymore. This bird should be listed. Hopefully the DEC will list this bird at some point. Um, very, very hard. And this year they were gone from Madawaska, which was a, a the one spot you could rely on, and they weren't there this year. So a bird in, in pretty steep decline. I used to see in migration hundreds of these birds, and now you see maybe five. The, the largest flock I saw was a couple of years ago, 16, and that was a large flock, and it used to be hundreds. So something's definitely going on with Rusty Blackbird. Um, and we have lots of beaver habitat, um, so something something else is going on, and I know they're, they've been trying to figure it out. I know scientists are working on it, but no one has really come up with an exact answer of what's happening to this bird yet. It's a female. This bird tried to nest along Savatis Road in Long Lake um, in an alder marsh at the inlet of Little Tupper Lake, which is somewhat unusual. So if they can't get spruce trees close enough to their mucky, mucky, muddy areas that they like to forage in, they'll nest right in alders, but that's a little precarious and that didn't work out for this bird. It would sit and, and sing right at the edge of the road and I'd find it there, and, but it, the, the nest didn't appear to work out. It would be a lot of predators for uh, a nest in alders right at that particular spot. Okay, I'm going to move on. And then I, I, I added these two crossbills and Russ was asking me about winter birds. And we had, um, when Linda and I spoke, we decided to do the boreal birds presentation, but I do have a winter eruptive bird <laughs> of the Adirondacks. But I did have these two in here because they are year round nesters um, in the Adirondacks. And so I always usually include these two birds in the boreal in the Boreal Birds presentation. This is a red crossbill, very brick red color. And this bird is pretty much around in the Adirondacks every year, as long as we have cones of some kind. Um, if we don't have any cones, they end up on Long Island and you guys get to see them down there. <laughs> um, but otherwise there, there are usually some populations around every year and they tend to nest in late summer and then again in the winter. And they have a heavy jip chip jip chip call and well, and you should be seeing purple over the Adirondacks. This is another one of those maps that needs a change. <laughs> it's not just a, yeah, this is a, we, they, we have breeding red crossbills in the Adirondacks. So that should definitely be on the range map there. And here's a red crossbill, again, that brick red kind of color. 
with a crossed bill and the bills cross, the lower mandible crosses to the left or the right 50%, 50% of them cross to the left and 50% of the lower mandibles cross to the right. So it's 50-50 in white wing cross bill, 75-25. And no one knows the mechanism of how the bill crosses because the fledglings don't have a bill that crosses for two weeks after they leave a nest. So no one really knows the mechanism for how the bill crosses. Um, here's a female and she's kind of a yellow green, beautiful birds. Here's a pair in the road, unfortunately. They do a lot of gritting like a lot of finches and they don't fly up in time. They don't get squished though. They fly up last minute and they get hit by grills. So they're usually intact. And if you can find them before the snow plows plow them away, um, lots of people like to collect these birds. Um, the, pe the people have permits to do that, like professors or people like Jeremy at the museum who puts them in the collection. Here's a red cross bill male on the left. And I caught mate feeding. This is at the Boreas River Bridge in Minerva where they are again this year. Um, there's a lot of red cross bills in that area in Minerva now. Um, and the male is feeding the female and that's part of courtship and it's really important. In the old days, when it used to be 30 below for a couple of weeks, it was really important for that female to stay on the eggs and for the male to come feed her. So you can imagine that mate feeding is a very important part of uh, their, their courtship. Again, there's a male, just beautiful in the backs too, and they're gorgeous birds. And I'll keep moving to this is a defensive position. Uh, this bird was upset because there was another male flying over head and it uh, looked up and opened up its bill. It was an aggressive move. Female, he's with uh, this is Usnia, by the way, old man's beard. It's a lichen that grows in the Adirondacks. The uh, northern Perula use these to create their nests. And this is a, a male feeding in tamarack cones. There's a baby, and it looks like a big siskin with a crossed bill in the middle there, very striped. And there's another baby. Um, I was looking at a flock of red cross bills at the Boreas River Bridge and I heard a noise and looked up and there were two babies perched right over my head. <laughs> and I had to back up to get this photo with my scope. And here's a video of a, a red cross bill gritting. And so the head always turns in the direction that the lower mandible is pointing. So if the lower mandible um, crosses and points to the left, the bird will turn its head to the left when it's eating, drinking, gritting, whatever it's doing. So, um, and you'll see that in the video coming up too. Here's a, a female red cross bill feeding in tamarack cones. And I'm gonna jump ahead to the white wing cross bill. Um, this is my last bird. And you can see this is what Matt Young calls the boreal cross bill. Um, it, it's pretty much predominantly in boreal habitat, unlike the red cross bill. If you notice the range map for the red cross bill, the range went all the way down through the west, down into Mexico and into Central America. So the red cross bill is a, a Western bird too, but the white cross bill is more of a boreal cross bill. It's got a beautiful song. It's kind of long like a winter wren. <laughs> it just goes on and on. Uh, very pretty. And they nest in colonies, by the way, the cross bills and white wing cross bills and red cross bills tend to nest near each other also. So not just colonies of white wing cross bills, but red cross bills too. So you'll find them all gritting together. They have like gritting parties in the road where the both species grit together. This is the call note. It's a quick, 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 quick. Not as harsh of a gift gift as the, as the red cross bill. And the males are more of a pink red than the, um, the red cross bill. So here is a female and a male and they've got the wing bars. Here's a male that I photographed on Sabatis Road and they can be kind of multicolor as it's transitioning. And here's a, a male, again, it's a very pink red, not like the brick red of a red cross bill. It's a kind of a pinky color. This was on Sabatis Road. This I didn't believe was along Tahaz Road and during that big eruption we had like a year or two ago um, in winter. And this bird was singing. And here's a bird singing along Sabatis Road. Most of the time they pick a dead snag, like a McNeil's thrush, to sing from. And if you watch the throat, you can really see it vibrate when, they, when they're singing. There was a big colony of them here. This was along a wetland. They drink a lot of water, both white-winged and red crossbills, so they often nest near water sources, just to give you a hint if you're looking for habitat. Um, they're almost always near a brook or some kind of open water where they can get to water to drink. This is a, a Cornell 
wonderful Cornell video um, where they show you up close. I'm going to let this play because it's going to talk um, how they actually use that bill to open up homes. Of the 10,000 bird species on Earth, only five, all in the finch family, have crossed bills. The white-winged crossbill is found in the higher latitudes of North America, traveling from coast to coast in large flocks in search of white spruce trees. Females are greenish-yellow, males red, and both have two distinct white bars on the wings. Their unique crossed bill, with the lower mandible curving under the upper maxilla, is adapted to reach heavily protected seeds found under tough cone scales. To reach the seeds, a white wing places the tip of the curved lower mandible against the cone while inserting the upper maxilla under the scale. Beak partially open, the bird uses the curved mandible as a lever, twisting his head as he pries up the scale. He eats the seed, discarding the husk. The curve of the mandible provides the leverage needed to force the scale up, enabling crossbills to feed on seeds that are not accessible to other species. A white wing often twists the cone off and carries it to a perch where it holds the cone in one claw and rotates it like a corn cob. Lower mandibles cross either left or right, and each individual always holds the cone in the claw toward which their mandible curves. This ensures that the tip of the mandible is facing the cone, giving the bird the best leverage to quickly pluck the seeds. White wings are remarkably efficient at harvesting their food. An individual bird can eat up to 3,000 seeds per day. Crossbills are able to swiftly bypass a conifer's armor as a direct result of their specialized beaks, an excellent example of evolutionary adaptation. I think that's a great video <laughs> to show yeah. how that does to show how that bill actually works. So they 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 use that as a lever, but then they stick their tongue and get the seed. So um, anyway, it's remarkable. Um, it really is a remarkable adaptation. So um, these are just some of the birds that I've had in my presentations over the years. I didn't want to cover too many birds and I didn't want to feel like I was ignoring the ducks, but <laughs> we have, um, we're sort of the Southern edge up here for ring neck duck and common golden eye uh, nesting also. So I just wanted to sort of put those in there. We had a great spot here in Long Lake. We had, we were having severe storms all the time that are doing remarkable damage. And in July, uh, we made national news, my town. We had 10 inches of rain, I think overnight in like an hour or two. It was um, unbelievable. They had to evacuate part of the town. Uh, all of our roads um, were not, uh, not usable. So none of us could leave. We couldn't even get into town. We were trapped on our side of town. Um, all of the man-made and beaver created dams went out. Um, millions and millions of dollars have been spent in this town redoing bridges and things. I mean, just massive destruction that we had in July. And so a beautiful wetland where we had ringneck ducks and pie greaves and um, Virginia rails, usually three pairs, uh, it's gone. <laughs> it's just, the whole wetland is just gone because there was a giant beaver dam that went out and the beavers have not rebuilt it yet. So it's, it, it doesn't exist anymore. So I don't have ring neck ducks right down the road from me anymore, but they are in Tupper Lake. There's some areas there where you can see them on the causeway. And um, we have a lot of Merlins that's increasing. I just put down like what's happening with populations. American three-toed woodpecker is a stable, has a stable population yet in New York, we um, they could potentially be extirpated from New York now. I, I don't like to say that for sure because there are probably a lot of areas to still check. Um, but anyway, uh, they're, they're stable overall. And winter wren is stable, but it's showing declines in mountain bird watch data. Ruby crown kinglet stable, Swainson's thrush is stable, again, showing declines in mountain bird watch data. I'm seeing declines in Swainson's thrushes at the low elevation also. Uh, Cape May warbler has declined 70% in population since 1966. It's a huge decline. Tennessee warbler, which is a bird um, 
I've only seen one bird over the years. Uh, all the birds that I've seen have, have all appeared to be migrants. Um, and yet there, in 2020, the first year of the Atlas, I found one on the Blue Ridge Road that appeared to be territorial. It was flying around in a circle, singing. I have video, audio, I got everything of that bird. And then none of us refound it. Um, so it was just a one shot deal that this bird appeared to be territorial. And then this year in 2023, Tom Burke and Gail Benson were up and they found one carrying food on the Blue Ridge Road at that spot. So yes, <laughs> there was a nesting Tennessee warbler on the Blue Ridge Road. So that was really, really neat. Um, so very rare, very rare to find. Um, Bay-breasted warbler is also a very rare warbler to find in the Adirondacks and it has a stable population. Pine siskin has had a huge uh, drop. I think 70, or 60, yeah, seven, almost 70% drop in population since 1966, and Evening Grosbeak, the researcher, um, has now declared 92% drop since 1970. It's probably one of the most endangered birds now in, in North America with the population drop is Evening Grosbeak. I had 135 for six months last year. We had a huge eruption of Evening Grosbeaks in the winter, and um, they hit windows. <laughs> we had to move really quick and get screens on our windows and put things up because they were hitting windows, and that's one of the big ways that they die. Um, and it was, it was terrible. Um, and the, lots of times they would survive it when it first started happening. They, they're, they're pretty hardy. <laughs> they can hit a window pretty hard and still survive. But, um, that's one of the ways that they're, they're going. They used to be a big nesting bird up until about 10 years ago. Uh, I would have them at my feeders in the summer when I was feeding in summers before I had to stop for bear activity. Um, and I could find them nesting all over the Adirondacks. And then suddenly one year they just stopped. Uh, and it was very abrupt. And so they're just, I just don't find any nesting ones anymore. So anyway, I just wanted to throw those species in at the end. Um, so I'm done with the species. And I just have a few slides on where you can go. This is the Boreas River um, along Route 28 N in, in Minerva, a very pretty spot. And these are some of the bogs that you can visit. Uh, there's lots of bogs in the Adirondacks. Some are a little less accessible in winter um, and because the roads aren't plowed to some of these areas like Massawipi Meyer is not plowed, Madawaska is not plowed, Hitchens Bog is not plowed. So some of these areas you actually can't reach, Spring Pond Bogs, they're not plowed areas in wintertime, but most of the year you can you can reach these areas because we don't really have, we can, we can go to a lot of these places right through December now because we, we didn't have any snow cover until just a, just a few days ago. Um, we've had bare ground up here, um, changing quickly. And here are some wonderful rivers, and you can get to a lot of wonderful boreal habitat on these rivers. The Jordan River is spectacular. Uh, there's spruce grouse along that river. It's extremely remote and very hard to reach. Um, very hard. <laughs> it's a very hard place to get to. Um, lots of really neat boreal habitat along the rivers. Crossbills, um, or that's a great place to look for crossbills because they like that water. And then you can look over mountain, uh, in mountain summits, over 3,000 feet. Uh, to get to boreal habitat and lots and lots of trails with boreal habitat. Um, that's the Mountaineer Trail there in the background um, along uh, the outlet of Massawipi Lake. I didn't even put that one in there, but that's available most of the time. Dice. Oh, I'm not sure where I took that photo. There's a lot of areas that look that way. I can't remember, but this is the, the Mountaineer Trail here. The Wolf Pond Trail down at the bottom, that's a new trail along the Blue Ridge Road. <laughs> Excuse me. Two and a half miles through boreal habitat. And I have found the, <clears throat> the what we call the boreal trio, boreal chickadee, black pepper pecker, and Canada jays along that trail, and it leads to a, a beautiful overlook of the, the high peaks. It's really a gorgeous trail. So it's five miles round trip to do that trail. Um, I really like the Roosevelt Truck Trail, another two and a half mile trail between the Blue Ridge Road and, and Route 28 N. Both of those trails are in Minerva. And that's, that's great boreal habitat in the Roosevelt Truck Trail also. Okay, I don't know how long I went. Um, anyway, I think I used up my hour and a half that they gave me. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that's a black pet woodpecker there. And this is my last slide. So I don't know, I can't see. Oh, now I can see the chat to see if there's any questions. So should I go into that, Russ? Yes, please. Okay. Um, I was... I was afraid to go into it myself because it told me it would stop your screen sharing. So, oh, did I, I stop sharing? Um, I I... I'm not sure, but if and you I can like... see, and I can see people, right? Yeah. Okay. Please check the that's, chat. Yeah, that's better. Okay. Okay. Let me 
make this bigger. Okay. And now can people talk now or Russ, can they? Um. <laughs> I hate just doing presentations without people talking. But testing, testing. If you also, if you unmute. You can unmute yourselves now. Thank people you. can unmute themselves, good. Thank you for being so patient, everybody. I'll, I'll start off, um, number one, amazing information as well as, I mean, one slide, the slides were just stunning and the information, gee, I just don't know who else would be able to, to tell us some of those things that you know. You know, you have a, a lifetime of, of just being out there and learning from the birds themselves and thank you for I sharing. I wish I had a everything. lifetime. I used to be a computer systems engineer. <laughs> I worked for Data General and Apple Computer, and I so it was a very intense and, and compared to my life being out with birds, very boring. Compar comparatively speaking, I really love birds, but um, yeah, I, I got into birding in in two thousand, the year two thousand. So it's been a, a you know two and a half decades, I guess, coming up on two and a half decades. But um, yeah, I wish I had been out amongst birds when I was a little child. <laughs> yeah, okay. instead of yeah. instead of working with computers inside, I really love being outside. I would, I, I, I noticed one bird I've never seen and I want to is, and you mentioned goshawk several times. Uh, hard bird, hard bird to see. Oh, they're super secretive. It, really, the only way to see them to, to is to find a nest. Um, otherwise, it's really tough. It's just like hit and miss, like maybe seeing one fly across the road or something. And I, I've seen a couple perched. But it's hard to see them. It's it, they're, they're it's not like a broad wing hawk where you're seeing them every day. No, it's mm -hmm. it's a tough bird to see. So you really want to go find a nest. Um, and I'm very respectful at nest sites because they're known to attack people. But I stay back and just use a scope and try to be quiet. And um, and the nest that I was around, they were they never flew at me or you know tried to hit me or anything. So yeah, <laughs> okay. neat birds, very neat, wonderful parents. And uh. I know. In, I know. In the beginning, you mentioned that the three-toed woodpecker is hasn't been seen uh, since. No, it's been about a decade, I think. And um, I think I think there's going to be. I'm hopefully, I think there's a concerted effort to try to find find one. But I think you know they could be in a number of places. They can be in remote areas. So I don't like to write these things off and say it's extirpated. I think there's always a chance that there's still some out there. We'll find out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, someone in the chat asked if this would be recorded, and and uh, Joan was was kind enough to to allow us to record this. And I know uh, there were more people that wanted to get in than the hundred that did. Um, and I apologize to those people when when they do see the recording. And um, you know, we're glad that you wanted to join and I'll talk to our treasurer and see if we can upgrade to the next level of Zoom where we can have more than a hundred people because, you know, I think for Shoei's next presentation, we might have more than a hundred also. So, you know, I don't want people to be shut out anymore. So, so I think know. the next jump, I know with our Audubon chapter, I'm pretty sure it's a, it's a big jump after you go above a hundred. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think it's like maybe 500 or something. I think it, you can you can do a big jump. But yeah. but for some reason, I, I think it would only be like $180 to make that jump. So, you know. We'll yeah, I don't think it was much to, to yeah. do it. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so for the people that are listening to the recording, I apologize that you couldn't get in tonight. And and we'll, we'll make sure that doesn't happen again, I hope. Okay. Because I know everybody wanted to see Joan in person. And uh, they'll be able to see you on the recording, though. So that's good, too. <coughs> Does anyone have questions? I don't know. Do you I do see you... if, like Lisa Salomon, there were some more questions there. <laughs> OK. Uh, I'm just looking at them now for the first time. Oh, maybe I, yeah, I need to look in here. If anyone has any questions, please speak up as well. <laughs> I, I put one in the chat. My name's Lisa. I live in Minerva. 
So we have an incredible amount of birds here, but I've been seeing some Southern birds in my yard. Um, like last year, my father has a farm in, in Maryland where we have a ton of redheaded woodpeckers. There was one in my backyard here in Minerva last year. I'm like shocked to see one out of its range. Hmm. Are we finding more birds coming up from Southern areas? Well, the red-bellied woodpecker has been moving in. Um, I had one at my feeder. Uh, this yeah, this was a red head. It was, I was, it was crazy. Yeah. Wow. Red-bellied is definitely moving. North. There's a lot of birds moving north. And, and I would say that my feeder birds have changed completely over the past 20 years. I've got white-breasted nuthatches now, and I've got goldfinches. Normally, they'd even be gone, and they're, they're still here. And I've got big flocks of goldfinches. And yeah, my and, and blue jays. Blue jays used to not be here in winter. So I would say almost all my feeder birds, except the chickadees and red-breasted nuthatches, are different now. Um, yeah, changes are coming quickly. Tough to Titmouse, um, someone sent me a song they were hearing at the north end of Long Lake, and they didn't know what it was, and it was a Tough to Titmouse. I have ton of those. So it yeah. was, I think it was a nesting tough to dip mouse on Long Lake. So yeah, there's they're they're moving and they you can find them sometimes now in boreal habitat too. Um remarkable, yeah. This remarkable change is happening. Okay, I would it's sad I would like because we're you know on, on the other side of things we're losing boreal birds. So you know we're and we're gaining birds from the south. <laughs> so you know, sad. Go ahead, Russ. I would like to thank Pat Candelo who says that you can catch migrating goss, goshawks at Derby Hill in spring. So I will definitely be out there this spring. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Pat. And that anyone else who wants to go, that, sound, that sounds like yeah. a good spot. Joan, I just wanted to say thank you, Joan. Um, Bill and I have seen you on uh, Sabatis Road, and you helped us see the blackback woodpecker last year, and it was really amazing. So I'll probably see you sometime this winter on that road. Oh, <laughs> uh, were you were you guys the, the couple and did we hear a barred owl too? Was there a barred owl? No. No. Barred owl. no, but you were very excited about this black pack woodpecker and you were taking pictures of it. We have a lit we had a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel with us in the car. But uh we see you almost every year on Sabatis Road and you're always very kind to us. Oh, thanks. <laughs> You'll see us again and I'll say that was us. That was an excellent <laughs> presentation. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I get excited to see every bird. <laughs> yep, I never get tired of seeing any bird and watching what they're doing. Using ears, recognizing birds. <laughs> you have to be an ear birder in the thick habitat of parrots. Yeah, I we you know my husband and I spent a week in Arizona at the beginning of November, and um, what a difference you know <laughs> you can actually see them. Um, yeah, here you you gotta you know you have to be able to hear them. Yeah. Any other questions? Yep, yes, I have a question. Um, well, first of all, thank you for this amazing presentation. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and I wanted to know, um, I don't live in Adirondacks, but I travel there very often. And I wanted to know, like, for example, if, if you would recommend like a specific trail or a specific area that you know you can get to see most of the boreal birds or like that is a good amount of boreal birds around this time of the year during or during winter oh in winter um uh, yes this, mm -hmm. we have with this major blizzard going on <laughs> you have to be in snowshoes today to um yeah depending on the conditions sometimes you know you either have to be in skis or snowshoes depending on the amount of snow if you're going to walk a trail um, so in the winter, yeah. we, we do mostly car birding, like along boreal bird areas, you know, boreal bird habitat. I like that. Yeah, <laughs> you, can, you can do a I lot like of car birding. <laughs> yeah, I don't hike, unless there's a blackback woodpecker, and then, um, <laughs> yeah, right. Last, I think it was last year during one of our winter weekends, it was thigh deep, the snow. <laughs> Yeah. So I went to make no, sure. No, I'm, I'm okay. happy with car birding. Yeah, car birding would be fine. Winter, so you have to kind of sometimes wade through the snow if you want to do that or not. Oh, yeah. to see a blackback woodpecker. Because mm -hmm. um, it's good if you can hear one foraging. Blackback woodpeckers are really tame. So if you hear one foraging, you can stand under it for hours if it's going to stay in the tree. It's, you know, they don't oh, care. Yeah. They, don't, they don't care about you until they have a nest. And then they worry about uh -huh. anybody coming too close. But with, outside of nesting season, they don't care. They don't even look down. They don't even seem that they're in really I, a tame woodpecker, like super tame. Um, but yeah, yeah, there are some trails. The thing that's tricky with people saying, you know, where to go exactly, because 
uh, the, there's boreal birds in all different places. So I, you know, run around from place to place when people have long lists of birds they want to see. So Philadelphia vireos in a specific spot and boreal chickadees are in sort of specific spots and black-eyed woodpeckers. So everybody's sort of in, you know, you can go on trails that have black-eyed woodpeckers, boreal chickadees and, and Canada jays. But for the most part, mm -hmm. all the various, you know, boreal birds are kind of found in different slightly different habitats and so they're not all in one spot unfortunately yeah um, yes but there are some pretty good trails where you can at least hit the boreal trio and yeah okay thank you <laughs> it, uh gene barrett asked a question uh what is and, Le and lisa salomon also gave an answer but gene asked what is the best lake to see the loons with babies in which month and Lisa oh, Salomon no. said, I live on Minerva Lake and we have a nesting loon pair and their chicks usually hatch around June 21st to 25th. But uh, can you suggest another lake? Yeah, the they they have, um, it's interesting, um, Nina Shock said that they have, and this was a couple of years ago that she told me is they backed up their nesting a, a month already. Um, I remember we had a date of that, that photographer from New York City that was doing the children's book. And I went to the pond and I saw a lump <laughs> under the loon and then finally saw the little tiny chick. And it was probably a month earlier than we were going to meet. So I called him. I had like one or two bars and I called him on my cell phone and he didn't drive and took a cab to uh, the train station in New York City, took a train to um, Westport took a shuttle bus to Lake Placid, took a cab to Tupper Lake when I picked him up. He didn't drive at all. So it's really tough to get to the Adirondacks if you don't drive. Um, and then we spent those two days with our loon babies. The loon babies are coming earlier and earlier. Um, so a good pond is that middle pond. And it's on Floodwood Road is the name of the road. It's off Route 30. So um, if you're traveling uh, north on Route 30, after it leaves Tupper Lake up toward uh, Route 30 runs between, you know, Tupper Lake and Malone, um, there's a road called Floodwood Road and Middle Pond is the second pond. It's the middle. I guess there must be, there must be a third pond I haven't seen. <laughs> there's a green, I think it's called Green Pond and then Middle Pond. You can see the entire pond from the road. So, you, because most of the, the water bodies are too big, so the loons could be anywhere. But on Middle Pond, there's one pair of loons and it's a very small pond and you can actually always see them if they're there. I'm trying to think of another water body like that. In Massaweepi, at Deer Pond, you can see all of Deer Pond from the road. So you, you can kind of look for these small ponds that have loon pairs and then you can see them. So otherwise you, you need a boat, you know, you'd need to be in a canoe to go look at, and you can do that. You can get in the canoe and, you know, go, go looking for loons, but um, you want to pick little little ponds to be able to see them from the shoreline. So I take people regularly to Middle Pond so they can see loons and loon babies. Yeah, it's fun. I have a question about the two species of crossroads and, and, and if you know if they have a hybridized. Not that I'm aware of. No, but they hang out together. <laughs> They regularly hang out together. Right. Yeah, I have lots of pictures of both red and, and, and white wing crossbills together breeding and, and they seem to nest near each other. Um yeah, so they're kind of in these these colonies. Um when, when there's really good cones, they're they're in these colonies nesting. Yeah. And there's some nesting going on. There'll be some nesting going on this winter with red and white wing crossbills. Not in huge numbers, but there are some around. I counted 41 um white wing crossbills during the Saranac Lake Christmas bird count between Oregon Plains Road, Bigelow Road, Route 55. So that's a pretty good number for the, you know, that they've got up there. So, yeah. And we have thousands and thousands of Franciscans. I think we have every Franciscan in New York State right now. <laughs> huge, huge flocks of Franciscans. And they'll be nesting in March and April. They nest pretty early. And the crossbills will be nesting February, March. You see the babies by April. So they do usually a winter nesting and they do a late summer nesting. And they did a late summer nesting, the white and crossbills in the same areas. Yeah. Well, you, you got many thanks. Uh, Betty McGarry says fabulous presentation. And that she's sad to learn that many of these bird species are on the decline. But, but she thanks you for a great presentation. Yeah, it's a terrible thing to live here and love the birds and see, you know, just the habitat changing and the and the birds declining. Um, yeah, it's sad. I mean, the birds, I think, are declining in general. Obviously, you've yeah. seen all those reports about losing birds, but 
um, you know, that we may lose entire species from the Adirondacks is sad. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's it's bittersweet and I think it's everywhere. I mean, there, there are birds that we'll never see again on Long Island, like mm -hmm. some of the night jars. Uh, uh, we won't see them breeding anymore on Long Island, like we used to the night hawks. Mm -hmm. We see them fly past in the fall, especially, but they used to um, breed on Long Island and, and, you know, and there's other birds that are declining everywhere. So that's that's a bittersweet thing about birding. Right. Uh, but with organizations like many of the bird clubs, and I know many people online tonight are from bird clubs, uh, we all do what we can to 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 try to slow that down, if not stop it, and, and to conserve the birds and and make people aware. You know, people that aren't birders, if if we can teach them and make them aware, then they'll care. Um, and, and then they'll join in when we need them, uh, you know, to do things like pass the Birds and Bees Protect Protection Act. Mm -hmm. That's very so, you know, we're all here to try to get those things done to help the birds and the bees and and the habitats that they need. Um so it's getting a little late. That was just my my phone telling me it's time to go to bed. So <laughs> sleep alarm. And uh, we'll put this online by tomorrow, I hope. And will certainly be a presentation that I know I'm going to watch over and over again. And, and and enjoy it just as much every time. Uh, so thank you very much, Joan. You're welcome. Yeah. Nice to see some I, of the faces here. I'm... <laughs> I want to thank you also, Joan. It was really, really was fascinating. Sometimes I was just sort of glued to the screen. Beautiful pictures and, and the sounds of the birds are really wonderful. So thank you so much. I wish, I wish I you well. In person. It's nice when, when uh, people can ask questions during a presentation instead of after the fact. It's, uh, it's a little odd in Zoom but <laughs> because you're talking to a computer instead of talking to a uh, live right. people. So, yeah, it's a little strange. But... Okay. All right. Good job, well, if anybody Tom. has any other questions I didn't get to ask, they can always, you know, email or something too, so. John Tom Birch just wanted to say hello. Oh, and I hope, I, I hope the uh, bridge over Fishing Brook has been repaired since we were there. I don't see I don't see him. Oh, way over here. <laughs> I hear your voice, but I don't see you on the picture here. Oh, maybe I can um oh but there, thanks. Gail Benson. Now I see you. Now I see oh I see Gail. <laughs> yeah. It has been repaired. Yes, the bridge oh, is fixed. Thank heavens. I think it was out maybe a month, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it was a while. Yeah. yeah. So no. there was no no way to get between Long Lake and Newcomb. There aren't very many roads in the Adirondacks. So when you take out a road, <laughs> it's as yeah. as Tom and Gail know, what did you do? An extra hour to get to the Blue Ridge Road? Yeah, I had to go south to go north. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there were people in Long Lake that work in Newcomb and vice versa, and they had to add an extra hour to drive all the way around. Um <clears throat> that's what happens in the Adirondacks. Mm -hmm. So instead of a you know a ten minute drive, it was an hour drive. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, thanks a lot. Nice They're presentation. They're still doing repairs, Tom, from that. Really? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I think millions and millions of dollars of damage. They they haven't even done like all the little washouts that were here and there in the road. They were dealing with big stuff, and they what still about have to repair. What's that? What about Shaw Pond? Any plan to get? to speed the beavers up or something to get that back? I don't know what to do to get the beavers to put that dam back, but I really yeah. would like to convince them to do that because uh, that took away a lot of birds. I know. I, it's yeah. awful. And the olive sided flycatcher had just moved in. That yeah. was the first year that they nested. Um, not right at, you know, back a little bit, but, you know, because of the beaver well and they were there. And yeah, so all those birds will be, yeah, it's terrible. Um, well, I hope if you carry a bucket, them. You just carry a bucket of dirt a day. Maybe you can fill it in. <laughs> <I know. laughs> to talk to the beavers. I'm afraid that if they started to redo it, that somebody would, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what the people in town would do. It's a, it's kind of a scary thought because there are a lot of, a lot of people ended up, we, we heard, you know, we're blaming beavers for all the damage and it, it was the rain. <laughs> it was yeah. the climate and the severe storms that uh, took out all of those dams. So, 
anyway, the beavers are getting a lot of blame. So I don't know if they started to rebuild, if somebody would knock it out. I don't know. Yeah. You know, Hopefully not. It would be illegal. I mean, they're not supposed to do that. They're supposed to leave them alone. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you got to educate those folks. I know. <laughs> yeah. What were you on when I was talking about the Blue Ridge Road and the Tennessee Warbler? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 That was so great. So anyway, yeah, because I've never I've never found an actual nesting one. So that's <laughs> kind of exciting, I think. Maybe this summer. Yeah, I hope so. Anybody yeah. else have any questions? Okay. Oh. Russ is ready for bed. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. Hello. My name is Douglas Rogers. I'm from Colony, New York. And this is my first time on this presentation. Your presentation is terrific. Oh, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> did you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, I have um, birds in my backyard that come through, um, bluebirds, red cardinals, um, different birds every time. I love nature hikes. I love going look for um, different Birds, herons. I go to um different places like what's it called? It um out in Skyhari. And it's a really wonderful place to go birding too. Yeah, there's. I'm sure there's a lot of nice birding in the capital district. I became a birder up in the Adirondacks, but I I moved from the capital district when we moved up here. So I wasn't a birder then, but I'm sure there's some neat places down there to go birding too. And nice that you have birds in the backyard to look at. I, I always tell people to start that way, you know, look at the birds that are around you and then branch out by habitat. And birds are, most birds are pretty habitat specific. So once you, you learn ever, where you like to be. Did you ever heard of the, um, what's it called? The place down in Skahari, it's got, um, right in the 607 area code, there's a um, Montezuma, Oh, oh, yeah. Montezuma Wetlands. Yeah. 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 I got I went down there um a year ago and it was a terrific idea. I saw a heron down there. I saw everything. Yeah, Montezuma was needed. And uh it's actually kind of sad because when I um read on that, it used to be 20 miles long, Montezuma. When you read about the history, oh uh, now it's only about a mile. So Oh, it was destroyed by people. <laughs> it must have been quite, uh, quite a, quite a place in migration uh, when it was twenty miles long. Yeah. You know, I heard it used to be eight foot feet deeper too before, and then they drained it. Yeah, they're doing a lot of changes to it. I don't know what's going on. I'd have to talk to somebody who, who lives near there and knows what's going on with Montezuma. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. It always seems to be under construction. Anybody else have any questions on any of the boreal birds? Hopefully you can all visit the Adirondacks and see some of them. <laughs> it's neat. And the black flies aren't that bad. I've been getting a few questions lately about black flies. And you know, with the with the warmer springs, black flies need very cold springs, and we've had warm springs. So they're pesty like they are in Albany, but um, I don't find them that bad anymore. They're nothing like the 90s when you had to run from your house into your car and you were literally covered and they were following you into the car so you'd have hundreds in your car and you'd be covered in blood and your clothes would be blood and it was just it was really uh, hard to bird um years ago but now it's uh they're just a little pesty it's not bad yeah okay thank you joan and thank you everyone for coming and and for making uh th this a very pleasant evening for everybody thanks to joan uh, please check our website and our Facebook page or sign up for our email list and we'll let you know of upcoming presentations. Again, Shoei Mitra will be next month, second Tuesday of the month, same time, same bird channel. Uh, <laughs> we'll be talking about the half-hardy birds of Long Island, Long Island South Shore. And then uh, in April will be Joe Junta. He'll be talking all about the happy warblers that we'll start to see in April. Okay. <laughs> so thank you again, Joan, and everybody. And uh, thank you very much. You're welcome. Bye, everyone. All right. Have a Bye. good night, everyone. All right. Thanks, Joan. Survive the storm. Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>